the Director of Education for Comfort Keepers, which is a home care company. And we have been preventing the, uh, presenting the Savvy Seniors Program for a number of years at OPC. And basically, it's what you're interested in is what we look for to get presenters. It's not what we are choosing. So if you have an interest in a particular topic, please let Marianne know or myself know so that we can try to find speakers on that particular topic. Um, we want it to be of interest to you. Otherwise, we don't get the attendance and we would love to have the attendance and with winter coming, we think these programs are gonna be very valuable for you. And it also will give you another outlet so that you're not isolating yourself because it's snowing or cold outside. So um, today we are talking about a great uh, program called Advanced Care Planning, Making Your Wishes Known. So many of us don't do this. We don't plan. Um, I see this all the time. We don't plan for when we get older. We don't plan. We think we're going to have a perfect body the rest of our life. And oh, and behold, all of a sudden we have those knee replacements, shoulder replacements, whatever. So today I'm very pleased to present and I'm going to give you a little background on her. Uh, Linda Curdy Best, um, who is with Beaumont, I believe. Yes. With Beaumont. Um, she received her master's in social work from Wayne State University. She has over 31 years experience at Beaumont Health in the departments of social work and care management. And she was the manager of the social work department at Beaumont Royal Oak for 12 years and is currently the, ma the manager of respecting choices, advanced care planning for Beaumont Health. Uh, we'd like to know more about that when you start talking as well. Linda is a member at large on the American Case Management Association, the Great Lakes Chapter Board and serves as the chair of the education committee and is completing her three-year term on the Michigan chapter NASW board, which is a national association for social workers. Um, as the chapter committee on nominations and leadership representative for our regions eight and 11. I'm very pleased to introduce her to you and I'm excited to hear everything she has to say. Welcome. Okay. Thank you so much for that wonderful welcome. I am going to share, oh, can I share my screen? It says host disabled screen sharing. I just uh, made you a co-host. Yay, okay. All right, so let's see screen. Do you see my screen? <clears throat> Not yet. Not yet? No. So if you click share screen, then you can poke on what you want to share. You can do just that presentation or you can do your desktop. Yeah, so. There you go. There I go. Well, no, nope, not yet. Oh, gosh. Okay. Make sure it's open. Open it. Ahead. It is open. It oh. is open. So, yeah. so when you, oh, yep, there, there you go. Now it's working. Okay. Perfect. See, we don't use Zoom. So um, well, you're doing great. So bear with me. Okay, so I'm gonna talk with you today about respecting choices at Beaumont. Um, and as the, the introduction um, reported, I am the manager of our respecting choices at Beaumont Advanced Care Planning uh, Department for Beaumont Health. Um, so my office is at the corporate um, office in Southfield. So the objectives today are to discuss advanced care planning, um, to review the essential elements of an advanced directive document, and to understand available resources. And I have this notation at the bottom that this material may be sensitive for some people because sometimes thinking about some of this planning for future healthcare decisions um, can be uh, triggering for people who've had experiences with loved ones or family, or even professionally. And I just like to make that statement. So when we think about advanced directives or advanced care planning, what do we think about? Um, and I'm going to give you some um, additional information about what I'd like you to think about. Um, so advanced care planning is really important for all adults. I think we tend to think about um, advanced care planning for older persons and for people that maybe have health conditions. 
but actually advanced care planning is important for all adults 18 and over. It's a process It begins with a conversation where you're sharing your goals and treatment preferences for care if you were to become so sick or injured that you could not communicate your wishes yourself. It's person-centered because it's relying on what's important for you as a person um, to proactively put into um, to writing and to have conversations with important people about what your wishes and goals would be and your uh, wishes and treatment preferences would be. Um, it involves choosing a patient advocate. A patient advocate, otherwise known as a durable power of attorney for healthcare, is that person that you choose to make healthcare decisions for you um, and share your wishes with them when you may be in a position where you are unable to make those decisions yourself. And it allows you to put these wishes in writing by completing the advanced directive legal document. So thinking about it, um, discovering advanced care planning, choosing your health care, um, your patient advocate, or what's in some states known as your health care agent, talking about it, exploring experiences that you've had or that you've been a part of, um, your goals, your values, and your beliefs, what makes living well um, for you, what that, how you define that, um, and thinking about some care that may be acceptable or unacceptable, writing it, expressing your preferences, and then sharing it, making copies of a written plan if you put a written plan into place, and or just sharing your wishes and preferences with family and friends and your healthcare providers, even verbally. So when we think about advanced care planning, um, we ask people to think about fears or concerns that they might have for this type of planning. And I'll just name a few. It would be nice if this could be a little bit more interactive, but it's um, sometimes challenging in this advent of these virtual meetings. But a common fear or concern that people have is that if they identify someone as their patient advocate, that immediately that person steps into their role. And that person that you designate does not step into their role until two physicians or one physician and a licensed psychologist have determined that you are unable to make decisions for yourself. Um, so that person doesn't immediately have access and like start making medical decisions for you. Um, another fear or concern is that this is just for older people. And what we like to, or for uh, people that have a chronic condition or a life-threatening condition. And we talk about the fact that life is unpredictable and that um, there, are, there are times where um, a sudden illness or injury may render us even temporarily unable to make our own decisions. And so it's important that we've had these conversations and that we've thought about who uh, we would trust to represent us. And then for those of you who've completed an advanced directive, what do you hope that document will do for you? And most of the time what people communicate is that they want that document to be honored and respected and that their wishes and treatment preferences are honored and respected um, by those that they've appointed as their decision maker and by those um, that are providing their medical treatment. I'm not sure why my slides are not advancing. Sometimes you have to touch them. Yep, they yeah. are. Okay, so let's talk about, about it. The first thing to consider is who you might name as a patient advocate. And again, that person would make medical decisions on your behalf in the event that you're unable to make those decisions yourself. So thinking about who knows you well, who would honor your wishes, even if they're different than their own. So um, that's an important aspect. So this person isn't getting to just step in and decide for you. This person is representing your wishes. And who's available at the time when you need them and can make decisions under stressful situations. So some of the considerations are that this can be anyone over the age of 18 who will honor your wishes. It can be a family member, loved one, or a close friend. 
Um, they're only authorized to speak if you can't communicate. Um, and it can also be called a healthcare uh, proxy or agent, a healthcare surrogate, or durable power of attorney for healthcare. In Michigan, the designation is patient advocate or durable power of attorney for healthcare. Um, many times people naturally think about their closest family members, but sometimes when we review the elements like that this person needs to be able to honor and respect your wishes, even if they don't agree with them and be able to make decisions under stressful situations, Sometimes that causes people to pause and to rethink who they initially thought may be able to um, step into this role for them and make a different decision. Exploring experiences. So I sort of mentioned this um, in the beginning, but almost all of us have had some kind of experience professionally or personally where someone, we've, we've experienced a situation where someone was unable to make their own medical decisions due to a sudden illness or injury, and someone had to step into that role. And when you think back on that experience, we want you to think about what did you learn from that experience? Sometimes people tell us, I learned that family don't always agree. I learned that um, because we never talked about it, no one had any idea what my mom would have wanted or what my father would have wanted. Um, sometimes we learn or when, when we reflect back on these that because of that experience, because someone did that pre-planning, it was yes, a very sad experience, but it was less stressful than it would have been had we not talked about it. And so, when you're thinking about what's important to you, it's important to reflect back on some of these experiences because they may help you in developing your plan. The other thing we ask people to think about is living well. So if you were having a good day, what might happen on that day? Who would you talk to? What would you do? And the, why is this exploration important? Well, I think it's important because it helps someone understand what gives your life meaning and, and sort of like a reflection on quality of life. And so there's no way to prepare a patient advocate for every potential decision that they may be faced with. But if they understand what living well means to you, that may help frame some of the decisions that they may be placed into having to have some conversation about. So if living well means being active and being able to have um, conversations with those that are important in your life and being able to be interactive, that may really help frame up some decisions that someone may be forced into or placed into having to make for you. Um, so if that decision is about would you want to be alive, even if that meant that doctors thought that there was not a good chance, and by not a good chance, we mean less than 5% chance, that you would know the ability to know who you were with or who you were. Um, if I look back on your living well, and it's all about interacting with loved ones, then I have some understanding about whether that would be acceptable to continue medical treatment or to stop medical treatment. So in part of this um, living well, we ask people to think about this scenario, a sudden event, such as a car accident or an illness, left you unable to communicate, and you are receiving all the care needed to keep you alive. Um, the doctors believe that there is a little chance, and by that we mean less than 5% chance that you will ever recover the ability to know who you are or who you are with. And then we ask people to repeat back what the situation means to them. And this situation is not a situation where you are in fact brain dead. That's often a question that we get asked because brain death is a, um, is there's a legal definition of brain death. And in that scenario, no one needs to make a decision um, because 
it's a legal des it's a legal definition and healthcare providers have policies um, and there's no decision to be made. But this is a situation where you are unable to recover the ability to know who you are or who you are with. And in that situation, would you want to continue medical treatment or would you want to stop medical treatment? And in either case, you will be kept comfortable. So choosing your patient advocate designation on your advanced directive form. Again, that designation does not go into effect until two physicians or one physician and a licensed psychologist have determined and stated in writing that the patient can no longer um, participate if in their own medical decisions. And this may be temporarily or it may be long-term. Um, I first wanted to step back and talk about um, for a minute respecting choices. So respecting choices is a model that comes out of La Crosse, Wisconsin. Um, and in La Crosse, Wisconsin, they have a 20 year history of having these conversations um, about what's important to people and assisting with advanced care planning. Um, it's evidence-based and in, the, uh, in La Crosse, Wisconsin, they have a completion rate, an advanced directive completion rate of over 94% for their patient population of adults 18 and over. And so people might say, what's so unique about La Crosse, Wisconsin? Because nationally the average is 20 or 30%, Beaumont is pretty consistent with that national average. Um, so it is a more homogeneous population, but because they've really targeted and changed these conversations so that it's not about age, it's not about illness, it's about planning for future healthcare decisions. And it starts with that designation of a patient advocate because life is uncertain. We don't know when there may be a sudden event that would render us unable to make our own decisions. So um, we have um, on our website, um, many online resources, and I'll get to that in a minute, that include our document, some, um, some fact sheets and some worksheets, and our document is, uh, is translated into eight languages um, and English. Um, so if there's a need for another language, we have that as well. We have information about um, patient advocates and making um, information that you can provide to your patient advocate about their role. Um, and then talking about the advanced directives. So in Michigan, in order to make this a legal valid document, it needs to A, be called an advanced directive or a durable power of attorney for healthcare or a patient advocate designation. It needs to have a patient's name on it. It needs to identify a patient advocate and it needs to be signed and dated by the patient and signed and dated by two witnesses. And those dates and signatures much, must match for the patient and for the two witnesses. The witness cannot be the person that you've appointed as your patient advocate. It has to be someone over the age of 18. It cannot be someone that's related to you by blood, marriage, or adoption. Um, it cannot be your, um, your physician or a healthcare provider or an employee of a healthcare facility or a mental health uh, program that's treating or caring for you. It cannot be an employee of a life or a health insurance provider, and it cannot be um, someone that might benefit from your estate. So that poses some challenges and some barriers to completing the document. So that's why we always talk about the signatures or um, the conversations are more important than the document completion. A, because it better prepares your family for uh, what's important and your provider for what's important to you, but also sometimes getting uh, a document completed um, there can be barriers because of the witnessing uh, requirements by the state of Michigan. During COVID, we definitely were challenged by these witness requirements, especially for patients that came into the hospital that were extremely concerned because if you remember at the height of COVID and Beaumont saw um, the bulk of patients in Southeast Michigan, um, 
we were unable to have um, family or visitors at bedside uh, during some of that time. And so patients were admitted to the hospital and pretty worried about what happens if I'm suddenly unable to make decisions for myself. And so they wanted to complete a document. And so we were able to provide our team um, and patients that even if you complete a document, and you can't have it legally witnessed as the requirements um, by Michigan, that at least completing a document will give guidance and that we will respect and honor those, um, those wishes that you've put into writing to the best of our ability um, because we understand the challenges of COVID. And then we ask people to try and have that document completed appropriately when they are able. So we do have some workarounds for those situations. We are um, Beaumont Health and other providers in the state of Michigan are working with the legislation to try to have some changes made to this, um, these barriers uh, with the signature requirements. So again, it's important that we share. We share our wishes and treatment preferences. And if we complete a document that we discuss those choices with those closest to us, that we can change or revoke our advanced directive at any time. And it just means that you tell those people, you rip up that document. If your document has been uploaded into an electronic record, you tell us to revoke um, or expire it, that we encourage you to revisit the document yearly and make changes as necessary because the document does not expire. Um, your document can be uploaded to your electronic medical record and accessible across FOMAT um, if you are treated at another system. Many systems have a way that this can be done as well. We encourage that you review um, your wishes and preferences and your document every decade of your life, after the death of a loved one, after any divorce, any significant diagnosis, or any significant decline in functioning because you really want to make sure that your wishes and treatment preferences that you've identified are in alignment with your current situation. And sometimes that changes. And part of the respecting choices model is that there are different stages of advanced care planning. There's first steps for those that have not taken any kind of steps for advanced care planning. There's next steps for those that have a chronic condition and then there's advanced steps for those that are more frail and that their physician wouldn't be surprised if they um, did not, uh, th that they died within the next year or two. And those are much different kinds of conversations. So how to start these conversations with your family and friends. And I'm going to give you a copy of these slides. I'll make that available so that you have these, but Sometimes these are really hard conversations to have um, sometimes with those closest to us. So that saying something like, I was just on this webinar with savvy seniors and I wanna to talk to you about some things that I learned. Um, even though I'm okay right now, I'm worried that something might happen and I wanna be prepared. I need to think about um, the future. Will you help me? Um, so those are some ways to kind of bring this up. Um, and sometimes ways to conversation start with um, your provider, your physician. Um, I think I'd feel more comfortable if I died in the hospital. They take such good care of me. Um, I want to have a conversation about my wishes for end of life or even just something as simple as, have you heard about the respecting choices at Beaumont? Here's what I've um, learned so far and this is what I've thought about it. Um, Physicians are more likely to begin asking patients um, at their Medicare wellness visit because Medicare thinks that this is so important um, for comprehensive care that they've included some billing codes and they have um, waived the patient copay fee at the Medicare wellness visit. So it's not uncommon, some of you might say, like, I thought it was really weird at my Medicare wellness visit, my doctor started asking about that. Why? Well, that's because Medicare also views that it doesn't matter the decisions that you make, it's that you've thought about some of those decisions, because that's the best way that we can respect and honor your wishes and treatment preferences 
um, at a time when it's needed and that we know who to go to for those decision-making um, when you're unable to make your own decision. So we like to end with this quote that um, I have an advanced directive, not because I have a serious illness, but because I have a family. Um, and we think that that's important, that this isn't about, again, the more frail patient populations. Um, this isn't because of age, but this is because we have a family. Um, Remember, it's a process. It involves thinking about it, talking about it, writing it, and sharing it um, that we offer here at Beaumont one-to-one -one meetings with a certified facilitator who will take you through that conversation if you'd like. Um, we'll assist you with coordinating with your healthcare team and your patient advocate. And we do offer these group presentations and volunteer opportunities. Um, and Respecting choices at Beaumont, we make five promises. And our promises to you and to all of our patients in the community are that we will initiate these conversations, that we'll provide assistance with advanced care planning, we'll make sure plans are clear, we will maintain and retrieve plans, and that we'll follow plans appropriately. And then we have our department phone number, our email address, and our website. So I would like to open it up to any questions that anyone may have. And I see Priscilla has a question. So I don't know who has to unmute. Marianne, do you need to do that or can Priscilla? Um, no, people have to unmute themselves. Okay. Priscilla, do you see on um, the little microphone? Now I see it, yep. sorry. That's okay. Would you please go back to the addresses you just posted for email and website? I couldn't write fast enough. Oh, no, I'm and Linda, just... if you'd like, you can send those to me and I'll email them to everyone. Yes, I will do that. Thank if... you very much. I'll send some other information like the advanced directive document, um, the share your wishes, like how to have the information shared in your electronic record if you happen to be a Beaumont patient. Um, and I will share the patient advocate fact sheet um, so that, and then you can always go to our website to see other information. Um, we recently went live with uh, EPIC, um, which is our electronic health record um, advanced care planning activity. And as a part of that go live on our my chart, there is information and a link to our website um, and the ability for people to add or edit their patient advocate uh, designation and to upload their document, so. What if you're not a Beaumont patient? What if you're not a Beaumont patient? I would recommend that you, um, if you complete a document, I would recommend that you share that document um, by making many copies. I would share that with your family, definitely with your patient advocate, with your primary care physician or a physician that you think would be mm -hmm. most appropriate to have it. And um, if you've ever been a patient at a health system, you may want to ask them how to have that document uploaded. Unfortunately, the state of Michigan um, does not have a, like a central repository uh, there's a repository that exists on the western part of the state, but not all hospitals participate. Um, so it's, it, it's another thing that we need to advocate for, but most health systems have a way that you can request that your document be uploaded into your electronic health record. Linda, this is Martin Krieger. Uh, just a question. Do you have any examples of or suggestions relative to the living will? Not the naming the, the patient yes, advocate yes, per yes. se, because I know that's um, kind of legalese, but if you're going to write down some general instructions, uh, do you have any suggestions for that to be able to word correctly? yet not tie down so specifically that there's no avenue for maneuvering 
What yeah. I'm thinking is if you wrote in your um, living will that you didn't want to resuscitate and maybe during COVID, if the doctor felt well, if you were put on a ventilator, you could come through it. But if you weren't, you were basically done. You know, things like that, where you uh -huh. basically give your wishes, but in this era of new uh, medicine mm -hmm. and the right to try uh, laws, mm -hmm. that you don't tie it down so tightly that there's no wiggle room for your patient advocate to work around it with the doctors. I, I just okay. think of the wording, it's so critical and there's not a lot of help with that. Um, we do have some optional worksheets that include language about um, feeding or artificial nutrition, um, CPR and uh, breathing assistance. Um, that I can also attach. Thank you. So a living will is um, more about some of those preferences. Um, the legal part of the advanced directive is the appointment of the patient advocate. Um, the wishes and preferences are more kind of like an alignment with a living will, which are guidance to your providers, to the healthcare team, and to your, the people that would have to be making the decision, um, but their guidance. So um, without an actual medical order, even if you were to elect say, I never want CPR as an example, you would need to have a physician order or a community do not resuscitate form because out in the community, um, EMS and other medical providers have to have an order. You, you know what I'm saying? They can't just know that this is what you wanted. They have oh. to have a medical order. They can't just on their own independently make a decision. So I know that that's not quite answering your question, but we do have some optional worksheets that say things like if my physician were to determine that the, um, burden outweighs the um, the benefit, you know, so there are some ways. Um, the most important thing that I would say to you is make sure that you've had good conversations with your patient advocate and that your patient advocate will agree to follow your wishes and preferences um, and knows what's important to you. Okay, uh, that's very helpful and some of those uh additional documents uh, would, okay. I would have greatly appreciate that. Sure. Any other kinds of questions? Has anyone already done this type of planning? Yes, I have. And I have a question. Yes. Um, what if I have an advanced directive, uh -huh. but what if I change my mind down the road because I find one of my children would be better at it than the other one. Sure. Do I need a lawyer? Do I need to go to a lawyer to edit no. that? Or can I do it on my own? Well, so you could uh, complete a new document and you do not need an attorney to complete a document. Oh, so okay. Then you need to um, have the elements that are necessary. So I'll, I'll send you um, at least Beaumont's form, but you need okay. to have your name on it. You need to name a patient advocate and or a successor um, if that person is unavailable. Um, mm -hmm. You need to sign and date it and two witnesses need to sign and date the form. That's what makes it a legal document in the state. Okay. Um, so in terms of if you already have a document on file, it would be important to tell all those people that you may have shared that document with that you have a new document. Okay. Um, within our electronic record, we have a way to um, expire it, even though it doesn't expire, so that the new document would be the document that people are referring to. Okay, thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and if you go to an attorney, you certainly welcome to go to an attorney. You don't need to. I, I believe that making um, decisions about finances, you probably need an attorney. You need right. direction about, you know, a trust, mm -hmm. all of that, like, so to protect your assets. Um, 
but for medical um, and healthcare mm -hmm. decisions, you, you want to document that only reflects your healthcare decisions. So sometimes we get these 22 page wills that include a paragraph about medical, you know, like that puts the providers in a real challenging situation when emergency, mm -hmm. they need to look to something. They want something that's really clear and easy for them to quickly peruse so that they know who they talk to, who they who makes mm -hmm. your decisions, et cetera. They can't go hunting and pecking through the 22 pages of finances. And plus, do you want that financial information in your electronic no. record? No. I don't. And I work for Beaumont. <laughs> oh. You know, so I have an, um, oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Dad. I have one other thing that I want to mention that we heard at OPC one time that I had never thought about. I do have one of those little badges on my refrigerator for um, responders. And the gal told us then that we should have our advanced directive in that yeah. little folder along with our, you know, medical information. Yes. Yes. It's how. Um, we do have some um, magnet like clips um, mm -hmm. and that I could send you um, if you email me your address and I don't know how you could get them to the group, but maybe when you all are able to meet in person, there'd be a way. <laughs> yeah. Yes. We got the file of life magnets from the fire department in Ascension. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. But we could um, definitely, if you want to drop some by, I can okay. make them available to anyone who wants them. Okay, sounds good. And it looks like Chris is has. Um, and wait, before before you go on, can I just uh, reiterate something that Darlene was talking about? Mm -hmm. Because um, it is important that you know who you're choosing, and you can change your mind. So in, yes. for instance, um, my husband and I are going through the passing of a pet right now. And just from how he's reacting to this, I have chosen to change my, to our eldest daughter to be my medical advocate instead of my husband. And we talked about it as a family and he even agreed, but I talked to my daughter to make sure that she understood why I was making that decision. And, you know, so a lot of people I found, they choose their, their advocate and sometimes don't even tell them. Yeah, no. So it's important that you talk yes. about your wishes mm -hmm. with yes. that advocate because this is a person that really needs to align and understand and you trust to do what you're asking them to do. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, sorry. No, that's a great point. Chris, did you have a question? I, I well, I wanted to mention a couple of things. Number one, um, this was at least 10 years ago, but I carried my parents' power of attorney of health matters in my car because mm -hmm. they lived in Ann Arbor and I had multiple trips down to ER, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that came into play was dementia. And you talk about the ability to communicate. Mm -hmm. And I certainly would never go against my parents if they said, I want to live. Mm -hmm. But my mother had made it very, both of my parents had made it very clear they had DNR statements. But in the emergency, my father was saying complete resuscitation and the doctors pulled me aside and said, your 92 year old mother will not survive the violent resuscitation required, the broken ribs, uh, etc. And I said, you need to talk to him because he's primary. I can't do anything about it. Um, and I understood my father's wishes to keep my mother alive no matter what. Luckily, it calmed down um, and she survived that episode. But a lawyer at OPC had told us about how <clears throat> when his mother was in the hospital and they said, we can't find anything, we're going to release her. And she said, I'm fine. And he could see and know that she was in no shape to um, take care of herself at home. She'd collapse again. Being the patient advocate, he had to 
jump through hoops to get her released to a, a private hospital to take care of her and recovered and she lived three more years. But if she had gone home, she would have collapsed. So it's just the idea of the patient communication in, um, in a serious illness doesn't always mean they're cogent about what's going on. And so you, you have these tensions in, in, in you know, the, the, whether it be family or um, the medical community having to follow their guidelines of three days and out um, or less. So uh, do you have any advice about that situation? Well, I think that if someone, if I, I think that if you're working with someone or your family member has um, some beginnings of dementia, it would be important um, to have a document completed and then to also have a lot of robust conversations, recognizing that as time went on, possibly that person um, may may not consistently make the same choices, you know, and trying to reconcile yourself with that. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty, you're asking a very broad question. I think that, you know, if you know that you've had those really good conversations with your mom and you understand that from where your dad is coming from, you know, sometimes you need to honor the decision that your mom originally made you know, and, and, and supersede what your dad's wishes are at that moment. I will admit that I asked the doctors to bring up hospice at that mm -hmm. point, mm -hmm. just so we could have the conversation to mentally prep for the future. Mm -hmm. um, make them the bad guy, not me. Right. Yeah. Okay, I'm done. I mean, these are not easy, again, these are not easy conversations and they're not, and they're stressful situations and they don't always go perfectly. That's why we say to people, reflect back on experiences because you, you, you've normally learned something. Um, you know, Mary Ann shared, she learned something about an experience with her pet. I mean, so that helps, that helps guide um, decisions that she's going to make because she saw a reaction and she thought, well, maybe under stressful situations, it may be too difficult for him to make a decision, whatever it is, for whatever reason. Um, so I think, I think that we don't always give enough credit to the importance of the conversation. Thanksgiving um, is a perfect time. We always talk about talking turkey um, your families come together. It's a great time to say, you know, I've made some changes to my document or I want to again remind all of you that I have a document. This is where it's located. Here's another copy if you lost yours. I met with a patient yesterday and she told me she has no children, but she has a niece and nephew. And she said, you know, every time I see them, I remind them, I gave you a copy of my document. Do you, do you know where, where it is? And she also has a copy on her refrigerator and in her important document files, but she's constantly reminded them of that. And I'm not sure if Chris is the, is the one who asked a question yet. Oh, that's me. And, and actually I was glad to hear the person uh, that made the, the comment. Uh, I have a question, but if you don't mind, I'll share an experience that might help that person. Okay. Um, it, it may help to have a, a, a mediator that, um, that your spouse or, peer or parent um, views as a, as a peer and will listen to them. Uh, in our circumstance, my mother only wanted my sister. My sister's in California uh, and it was her lawyer that was uh, taking care of us, drafting my mother's uh, will and, and wishes that reasoned with my mother um, and said, you, the person who is going to, who wants to deal with you is sitting next to you right now. 
And the reality is, is when it came down to the, the time where decisions had to be made, very literally, quote unquote, my sister's words were just stick her somewhere. And so uh, it, it, having the mediation of somebody that my mother was never going to listen to me and the reasons why it was better for me to be the one who was going to help her with her decisions and ultimately make her decisions. It really take, it took somebody that was uh, in her estimation a peer and, uh, and, and that, did, that did work for us. And thank goodness, uh, it would have been a nightmare if my sister had been in charge of the circumstance. And she's a marriage and family therapist, by the way, but she, she did not have the connection with my mother and she didn't want to do it where I was here and, and I did. So, um, and, and her outcome was, you know, it was a privilege to take care of her and her outcome was as good as it could have been. So, um, uh, but I really needed that lawyer or that other opinion to reach my mother so that she could make, while she still could make the best choice for herself. She wasn't going to listen to me. I'm, I'm too gentle and too kind. <laughs> so um, if I can ask my question, sure. how, uh, if, if we don't have a printer, Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, you know, I have, I've been to several hospitals and so I have some records, some, you know, multiple places. How do we get the worksheets? Um, I, I really do. I'm, I'm off right now. You can probably hear my voice. I'm off on a medical and, um, I, I need to have these things filed because I don't have uh, immediate family nearby and I wouldn't, and I wouldn't want my sister to be, <laughs> I love my sister, but I, I wouldn't want her to be coming from California to stick me somewhere. <laughs> when you, um, when you get the email that I'm going to send to Marianne that will have some of the documents in our website, it will also have my email address and I'm happy to mail out hard copies of anything to anyone you know you just I just need to have your address and and we'll do that I mail stuff all the time so not a problem and um and also do we um um you know part of it and I did submit this to Marianne was about finding uh a competent legal people that will genuinely be our advocate and not working for themselves or some other, you know, odd entities that are out there. Um, you know, how do we, how do we find those ones that really are uh, invested in being our personal centered uh, uh, person to uh, get our wishes down and enforce them if need be. And I will tell you that although my mother's lawyer made a couple of errors that, that really were annoying, uh, they physically had to go and, <laughs> and have meetings with my sister and say, um, you know, from California on the, on the, because of an error, it is, he really did work for my mother's benefit. And, um, you know, so how, how do we find somebody that is uh, competent? And do you mean, an attorney to work with? I'm yes, okay. and it, because it, it seems like there's two things that need to, uh, main things that need to have, uh, have happen here. We need the medical directive, we need a living will, and, and we, need, we need to have a will that uh, uh, ties everything all together to make sure that all of our circumstances are taken care of. So I would have to defer to Marianne and Annette if you happen to have like um, some thoughts about elder law attorneys um, that you've worked with in the past. Um, yeah, we highly recommend going to an elder law attorney and I'm not saying just one. You can get consultations with more than one and find out who's gonna be working with you as a benefit maybe ask friends that maybe have used an elder law attorney in the past mm -hmm. um, that has worked out very well. I know I, I'm a facilitator for the Alzheimer's Association and they have a helpline. If you call them and said, I'm looking for an elder law attorney, they will send you a list of elder law attorneys, not one, but it'll be multiples. Um, so that's a way. Um, I know OPC, we have had multiple elder law attorneys that have come and presented to give individuals information that is needed. In fact, and they are not always the same elder law attorney. So these are people who we have worked with. If you have a trust and you've worked with an elder law attorney and you know a friend, ask them about it. 
it's word of mouth. Who do you feel comfortable with? You know, and it's it's also important to um, to ask the questions. You know, when you're interviewing these attorneys, right? Yeah. So um, because everyone, nobody can be an expert at everything, right? So ask specific questions because there are specific attorneys that um, really understand on a very detailed basic basis, you know, a dementia, you know, when you're dealing with these kind of forms. And there's some that just treat it the same as if for anybody. So right. you really want to have your questions um, ready and don't be afraid to interview, right? But I love Annette's suggestion at asking your friends and neighbors too. Yeah, that I think that's critical. And I do want to interject. Unfortunately, I went through all of this uh, a little over a year ago. My husband passed away and I had to do advanced care. We had advanced care planning in place. And even though you have that in place, it's probably the hardest decision you will ever, ever make. And I do, he was at Beaumont Royal Oak. And I do have to say that his physicians um, were amazing in that they were my, they became my partner in guiding me why that decision that I needed to make at that very end was so critical. But they, you know, look to your physicians, especially, I mean, my husband had a lot of subspecialties, but there were like two or three of those subspecialists that we have been with a very long time. And they're the ones who become your partner and guide you. It's not like, oh yeah, he has to go tomorrow or whatever. They're there to answer your questions, but you need to ask them. There was a time that my husband, it, it, he had to have his dialysis turned off. He was on 24 hour dialysis. Well, when that happens, you know what the end result is going to be. And it was very difficult. My husband one day was very cognizant and the nephrologist is talking to him, explaining things. And all of a sudden that advanced care planning went adios. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I, my eyes probably got 10 times as wide and the nephrologist continued to explain in real layman terms what would happen? And he went, oh, no, 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 no. I don't want that. Mm -hmm. He said, my wife knows I don't want that. And mm -hmm. we just said, well, then we're going to definitely go into hospice and make you comfortable. You know, but it's looking for those medical partners, you mm -hmm. know, even your advocate. I mean, when you're the advocate, mm -hmm. even though it's on paper, it's still very, very hard. Mm -hmm. It is. It's it, and people have to be willing to accept that role. Mm -hmm. um, they don't have to sign the um, the acceptance until they're they're put into the into the need to make the decisions. But you want to make sure that they're comfortable with that because it's it is a hard a hard decision thing hard to ask people to do. I um, I liked a lot what you said, Annette. It's about a pause. And I think Priscilla brought up um, some information about your family. And I, I forgot to also discuss that I think in situations where there's some dementia or Alzheimer, I would encourage you there are, are some documents that are more directed toward that population of people. So, um, and I'm sure the Alzheimer Association or I could uh, dig something up yes. has something that would yeah. be well, that's a good segment. Um, tomorrow we have uh, oh. some elder law attorneys uh, joining us on Zoom. Uh, it's going. It's called "Preserving Dignity: Preparing for Legal Challenges in the Face of Dementia." So there are four sessions. It starts at eight thirty tomorrow morning. The first one is um, with a uh, Kara. Like, uh, so we have an attorney and a physician talking about starting the conversation. At, um, at 9.15, we have uh, Don Rosenberg, who's a very uh, uh, well-known, Annette and I have worked with him for years. He's an elder law attorney. He's going to talk about getting all your ducks in a row. What do you need? Then at um, 10.15, we're going to talk about long, long care uh long-term care insurance, because, you know, I don't, I can't tell you when I, when I worked in the senior 
living industry, how many people came and said, is it too late for us to buy long-term care to pay for my dad's living here? And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Time ago. Um, <laughs> the session four is going to be a panel and it's going to be people just like us who have went through the system and how they navigate it. So they're going to tell you their experiences and their wins and their losses. So I think that's going to be really important. Now, I know it's a long time, 8.30 to 12.30, but log on and kind of keep it in the background when you're, you're working or whatever, um, or just look at what sessions interest you and, and join at that time. But it's pretty powerful. We have everything we talked about, how important today is. They're all going to be here tomorrow morning. So check it out. What's is that going to be recorded? Called? Yeah, I'll record it too. But it's, What's the series called? It's called Preserving Dignity, Preparing for Legal Challenges in the Face of Dementia. And, you know, the scariest part about that, Linda, is, you know, Anna Annette, you know, statistically, the Alzheimer's Association say that um, any senior over the age of 80 has some form of memory loss, right? Mm -hmm. So yes. this isn't every other person you see, right, over the age of 80 mm -hmm. has some type of memory loss and so this isn't for you know the person next door this you know it's every other person you see this is good information you know so uh, so yeah tune in and the, statistic, and the statistics show i mean by the year 2050 they're predicting maybe almost 50 percent of the people will have some type of memory issue right so it's, well, they're already it's, saying that they're saying that right now Every other senior you see over 80 has some sort of memory loss. And we know. Really yeah. One out of three, one out of three in their 80s okay. have some yeah. type of memory loss. I think what's really critical is Marianne and I are, are, and I'm sure Linda, you're in the senior industry. When you're in a senior industry, you constantly have to be educated. I'm going tomorrow because they may be saying something I don't know. Right. Always be willing to learn new things. And by going to these conferences, you keep yourself aware so that you can make the right decisions for yourself and you can have that conversation with your family. That's so critical. But don't think you know everything. I don't know everything. So I'm, I want to attend as many of those presentations as I can to see, is there something I need to do for myself, for my family, or can I give a resource to one of you that will help you make the decision that you need to do in the future? So I think though, you know, these classes are really critical. Linda, you did a fabulous job. I think so yeah. many of the average person does not do any type of planning at all. No, no, because nationally, <clears throat> the completion rate is about 20 or 30%. It's horrible. And you don't realize how critical it is mm -hmm. to at that end point to have that decision already made mm -hmm. because it's, you know, you don't, you, it, you, you can't say it's never going to happen to me mm -hmm. because it does happen to all of us. So mm -hmm. I know for myself, I'd rather say, hey, kids, this is what mom really wants. <coughs> this is where I will be happiest. Do you have, you know, or do you agree with this? Why don't you agree? And even if they don't agree, I'm still going to do what I want to do. And if, if like Marianne said, you may have to choose another advocate if you don't choose your children. But you want someone who's thinking in the same lines. And I'm blessed that my kids are thinking the same way I am. But having those conversations years ago, they would say, oh, mom, you know, I don't want to talk about that. Well, you know what, guys? Yes, you do have to talk about it. Right. It's important. The, the other thing is in Michigan, there isn't substituted judge uh, decision making. So if, if suddenly you become unable to make your own medical decisions in the hospital setting, we look to next of kin. Well, that may be in Marianne's case, not who she wants to be her decision maker. But, but if Marianne were in a position and then needed to leave the hospital, her family may in fact need to petition for a guardian because she has not taken those initial steps to appoint mm -hmm. a decision maker, but to sign her into a facility, somebody has to have that ability. So these are really important things to think about when you're well. 
not when you're sick. Right. Linda, that, is, that is so important. You know, I remember just you're saying that triggered this memory in my brain. And it was somebody once asked me, um, when should I start planning for this? And I said, well, you know, the, the, the time to start planning is when you want to make the decisions. Mm -hmm. So if you're cognitive and you, you know what you want, now is the time because if something happens, God forbid, and you haven't made those decisions, someone else is going to make them for you and they might not align with your wishes. And you definitely yeah. don't yeah, want to have a guardian or a conservator having to deal with all of this. Someone that has no, doesn't know anything about you or your family. Right. So Somebody just asked if they could ask a question. You sure can. Come on. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it pertains to this. Um, uh, the conservator thing that w was going on in, in Macomb County was really disturbing. Um, that's, you know, kind of mainly why I, I know I need to get this done. But uh, one thing that I, I actually learned today, and I have a question about it, is I, I have two people on my medical directive that are, are people I trust. However, there's a third person that I know who is a, um, I can't think of what her title is, but she works in a, a nursing facility. And, um, and, and she took care of our, our dear friend to her last breath, knowing every, everything that needed to be done, every transition she was going through. Is it possible to put a third person on? Because I would love to have her because she, she would be able to make those kinds of decisions like Annette was saying, um, seeing a transition and where uh, uh, a change where my directive may specify something, she would actually know and present it to me or them to discuss because it, it literally, um, the written words weren't defining exactly what she was seeing as a professional. And um, she, so can a third person be put on a, a medical directive? So typically what we recommend is a, the appointment of a patient advocate, a successor, and then um, a secondary um, after. So like naming them one, two, and three, but not three having all the power at the same time. If if you have more than one person, so some people want to name both of their children because, you know, I don't want someone to feel bad. Well, the problem will be those two may not necessarily agree. And so then you have some issues. So we normally say it's advisable, but you can do it to name one person, then name someone as your backup and then your secondary backup. Okay, so you could do it because I, I, I literally would not have any family member making any decisions for me. Um, uh, so it is, and, and I realized today that, that that one person uniquely would have, um, I, might, I might even put her as a second. <laughs> yeah, so. and you would clearly want to have a really good discussion with her about why you would, you're asking her to take on, you know, would she be willing to take on this role and then, you know, really good, robust conversation about what's important to you and some of your wishes and preferences. Okay, thank you. Yes, in, in her care, my every, every dignity would be maintained. Mm -hmm. And uh, whereas the, the gentlemen that I have as my directives, um, you know, they would do their best, but they, they certainly wouldn't do it at the level she would. So thank you. That's a um, important point. Thank you. Alinda, this is Barton Krieger again. Question <laughs> on uh, patient advocates uh, joining in on the uh, patient's uh, medical appointments as such. I see this more and more where the advocate joins uh, the patient with uh, all of the uh, medical appointments and critical information that comes through there. Just wondering what your thoughts are, if Beaumont has a perspective or if you know what doctors think about uh, a patient coming into a room or being in a examination room and their advocate being in the same room as well. Uh, just wanted your perspective on that. So 
my question back to you is, is the patient advocate activated at this time? Does the person not have the ability to make their own decisions or are you talking prior to the activation? Prior to activation. Um, so I think that that's a, a probably a personal decision. Um, I think that if someone felt that it was important for the patient advocate to be present at visits so that they heard firsthand and really understood um, you know, their loved ones or their friends' um, medical course and trajectory. Um, but some people may not be comfortable sharing that much information. So I, I think that that's a real personal decision. Do I think, what do I think medical providers? I would hope that medical providers would welcome whomever you as a patient wanted to be part of your team. And if that meant bringing someone along who um, may step into the role as patient advocate in the future, then so be it. Um, so I think that the most important piece is what does the patient want? You know, who do they want to share information with? Do they want all information shared? Um, or is it just at a specific time? So I, I think that that's something that would have to be considered. Okay. I was just thinking, uh, you know, the cases where uh, myself and my advocate have gone together, generally mm -hmm. you are both hearing what the doctor is saying and uh -huh. maybe the patient is less willing to accept what's being said, the advocate could kind of say, oh no, I think I heard this. And also I think the questions coming from two minds are better. Uh, and I was just, that's kind of why I was wondering what physicians say, it's like it's two against one or, you know, I'm getting drilled with all these questions. He's, you know, patient comes in and he's got somebody else with him and they're all <laughs> pestering me with questions and stuff. So I was just kind of curious. I will say this. I think the most important part for the advocate who's accompanying is to always remember their role. And their role is not activated until the patient can no longer make their own decisions. Right. So on the reverse, I have seen in the hospital setting, um, patients be admitted to the hospital and the family calling and, and making the statement like, well, I'm their patient advocate. Well, yeah, talk to your mom, but I'm the patient advocate. I appreciate that, but your role does not activate until your mom can't make her own decision. So I think it's like that balance um, because we do have our self-determination and we make our own medical decisions as long as we're able. Taking away someone's decision-making capacity is, is real. It, it, is real significant. Um, and so we want to respect and honor as long as we can. So Thank you. You're welcome. It looks like Priscilla. I'm not sure how long did we have today, Marianne? I we actually have another group that's waiting in the wings. Oh, oh never mind. Never okay. mind. So I wanted to close with, um, I will send an email um, with our website information, with some of our documents, with my email address and um, phone number so that you can reach me. I truly am appreciative of the opportunity um, that I've had this morning to meet with all of you. Um, every time that I meet with people, I learn more as well. So thank you for being a teacher to me. Um, and thank you for taking this first step, or maybe it's even a later step, but thank you for um, participating today. I appreciate the opportunity. And thank we you want to thank you, Linda. You are a wealth of knowledge. And mm -hmm. yes, just thank you very much. So nice to have such an advocate out there for us. Thank, thank you. you. It was incredibly Sarah. valuable. I feel thank much you. more secure <laughs> just hearing all of this. Yes. Yeah. Good, Thanks. good. And um, Linda's going to email me that information and I'll send it right out to you. Sounds good. Thank you, Marianne. Okay. Thank you again, Larry. Thank you. Before Thank you we log off, I just, um, in the chat, I posted the link to tomorrow's meeting. If you copy that oh, and put it in your browser, you can register for Preserving Dignity tomorrow. Uh, Marianne, it's not in the chat. 
It's not in the chat. I see it in the chat. Oh, I oh, don't. wait, I did it in the waiting room. Hang on a second, I'll do it again. I was gonna say, I don't see it. <laughs> Oh, it no. says to everyone in waiting room, but I do see it. Yeah, because you're a co-host. You know what? They used to let you do it to everyone. There, there's not an option. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and email it out to you guys. Okay. All right. Have a great day, Thank everybody. You. Thank Bye -bye. you so much, Linda, Annette, everyone mm -hmm. for coming. Have a wonderful day. And if you have any questions to further, uh, Priscilla, I'm sure Linda will be more than happy to, to help you. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you. All Bye. right. Bye, everybody.